Good afternoon to everybody. Sorry for the delay, a little delay, but uh, most of all, welcome to our first MED Dialogue 2020 promoted by ISPI and the Italian Minister of Foreign Affairs. Today, we turn the spotlight on the Syrian conflict, the biggest humanitarian emergency of our time, and one of the greatest challenges for modern uh, diplomacy. Nine years of wars, more than half the population forced to leave its own, countless rounds of talk. We are deeply honored and happy to host again, since you were with us in Rome, Gail Peterson, United Nations Special Envoy for Syria since uh, October 2018, who has accepted to inaugurate our MED virtual dialogue today. Thank you, Special Envoy. Thank you very much indeed. Mr. Peterson, when you accepted this position nearly two years ago, you inherited what many have described as the most difficult job in the world. Is it? Uh, well, um, to me, it looks like the most difficult job in the world. <laughs> but maybe we should ask the Secretary General if that's even a more uh, impossible challenge. But you're right. I mean, after... Um, well, nine and a half years of conflict, uh, war, and suffering. Uh, and after, you know, I'm the fourth envoy, as you know very well. And uh, frankly speaking, uh, we haven't made uh, much uh, progress. We, let's, let's be honest about it. And the challenges are enormous. But, but, but you knew it, it was an impossible job, a difficult job. What uh, surprised you? What did, what did you find even more complicated than you were expected? That's a good question. And I'm, I've been asking myself this all the time. I, you know, I think I mentioned to you in Rome that you know, when I ask uh, friends and colleagues that are respected, should I take on this job? They said, you must be crazy. You know, why, why <laughs> would you like to, to do this? And I, but I, I felt you know, uh, that you have an obligation to try. And I also felt that you know, after nine and a half, at the time, not nine and a half years, but you know, eight years of conflict, that maybe the time was getting more ripe, as you sometimes we say in conflict resolution, uh, for the possibilities to find a solution. I mean, it, it, it was a devastated country. Uh, if you looked at the situation on the ground, it was, uh, it, uh, to put it like this, it had created more clarity on the ground. Uh, and at the same time, it was clear sort of who was the key actors on the ground. So I, I saw sort of, sort of the, in, the picture on the ground and the international actors was, you know, it was so, sort of easier to get to terms with it. What, Crystallized. Yes, exactly. But what, what I, so, but I think, you know, what I suspected and what I found maybe not surprised about was that the lack of trust, of course, between the Syrian parties, I knew, I was not surprised, but also the deep mistrust between the international parties. And that, I think, is something that I've been struggling with, and like all my predecessors also been struggling with, but it's much deeper than I had uh, hoped. I had hoped it should be possible to, to sort of, to, to work out something that would make it possible for us to sort of get the process moving through, you know, working with the Syrian parties and the international uh, parties. That has been a great, great challenge. And I, I guess it still is uh, in a sense. But two days ago, you briefed the UN Security Council on the situation in Syria. Uh, what were your key messages to the member of the council? Well, you know, uh, I, as you know, I'm briefing the council every month. And, and sometimes I feel, uh, you know, really there is not much new to say. Uh, and uh, so I've been thinking of, you know, what, so what I did and what my team and I've been doing uh, the last few months is we have actively engaged with the Syrian civil society, ordinary Syrians, if you like to say, you know, both through what we call the, uh, the Syrian uh, civil society support room, through the Women's Advisory Board, and I'm meeting a lot of Syrian organizations working on detainees, abductees, and, and missing persons. So I wanted to convey to the Security Council what I'm being told by the Syrians that I'm interacting with. And you will not be surprised to hear that, of course, one, 
one of the I, I hear a lot of clear messages and, and listen these are from people across the board from sort of government controlled areas uh, from non-government controlled areas and of course also from within uh, the refugees communities and, and IDPs so what what I, you know I, and I, I said to the council that you know there is a deep frustration that after nine and a half years uh, the political process have not really been able to deliver tangible results for the Syrian people. And then, of course, the second message was that the dire economic situation that Syria is now uh, going through. And, and the third message was, you know, the, the violence and terrorism needs to end and there needs to be a, a nationwide uh, ceasefire. And then uh, I hear across the board frustration about no progress when it comes to detainees, abductees, and, uh, and uh, missing persons. And of course, you know, what can you do to help to create uh, the uh, conditions that would allow for the safe, voluntarily and dignified return of Syrian refugees and, and IDPs? So I, I sort of highlighted these uh, messages to, to, the, to the Security Council. And then, of course, I spent quite some time on uh, uh, you know, what is more and more looking like an economic collapse in, in Syria. I mean, through that with the, with the council, I highlighted, of course, uh, uh, more perhaps than I've done before. I challenged the Security Council and said, listen, you know, I need your help. The UN need your help if you want to move forward after nine and a half years of, of conflict. So I, I, I can get back to that a little bit uh, later in the conversation, if you like. But I think this is a key element. And of course, I, I mentioned the, the progress we made on the Constitution Committee and the work we're doing on ceasefire. So uh, I, I will not go into all the details, but that was sort of the, the, uh, the key messages I, I gave to the Council. Are you feeling, I mean, the, the world is facing other crises at, to, at the same time in many parts of the world at different levels. Are you feeling any uh, decreasing interest in the Syrian conflict at the UN, at the UN Security Council? I mean, the, the people you meet uh, represent countries which are themselves now facing incredible crisis. Uh, is there a, a, a lack of attention or, or, or business as usual uh, from that standpoint? Um, how to phrase this? I you know, I, I think you, your observation is absolutely correct that, of course, you have now the COVID-19 that sucks the oxygen out of the room for many, understandably so. And of course, yeah. Italy has gone through the crisis and you would understand that better than anyone. But I also believe there are deeper, deeper things at, at play here. And that is, of course, that with the conflict that's been going on for so long, it, it sort of becomes, you know, I think in, in, in the mindset of the press, of people, of government officials, it becomes part of the normal scenery. This is sort of what you expect. So, you know, I, and I, I remember I struggled with this at the very beginning that, you know, here you have had thousands of people being killed and it's not even close to headlines news anymore in, in Syria because this is what people expect to happen in Syria. Yes. And this, I think, is, is, is a deep frustration. Then I, I think I should add that, you know, to the credit of the Security Council, as I said, you know, I'm briefing them on a monthly basis. There is a monthly humanitarian briefing. There are briefings on other elements related to, to the Syrian crisis as well. So there is a lot of focus on Syria. But what, what, what I've said to the Council, what is lacking is real international cooperation. And here, of course, uh, I think it's fair to say that when it comes to, in particular, Russia, Iran, and Turkey, they, of course, are following this extremely closely. The United States also have troops on the ground following. And, of course, uh, with the European Union, it's more the humanitarian assistance. And, of course, the whole refugee issue that keeps going. And why then, within the Arab world, there is sort of what I would call of course, also still uh, an interest, but it's more you know, a concern that they are left out, they feel they are left out of the equation. So, you know, when I discuss with my, with my Arab friends, the foreign ministers and others in, in the Arab world, there is increasingly a concern 
that you know not only are we not finding a solution but they are not really they feel that they are being left out no, i understand what you mentioned on the uh, media fatigue because we are experiencing the same with libya uh, even in italy that we are so uh, close for many reasons but uh, at the end of the day people think that uh, okay again Aftar, again Siraj, it doesn't it's hard to follow development, but you mentioned, uh, uh, talking about the Security Council, uh, uh, you mentioned the ceasefire, and yeah. how was uh, Guterres appeal for a global ceasefire received in Syria specifically? Um, I, I you know, uh, first and foremost, I think it was an extremely important appeal, uh, because I think the Secretary General was one of the first to understand the seriousness the crisis that uh, the COVID-19 would bring to the global community. Uh, so we, you know, I discussed it with him, and I said, "Listen, why don't I follow up with with a with a more specific appeal for for Syria?" And he said, "Yes, please go ahead." So uh, the day after he launched his uh, his appeal in 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 mid March, I launched what I a call for a nationwide ceasefire in. Uh, in, in, in Syria. And I think, you know, uh, in my first briefing after I called for that to the Security Council, uh, you know, the Council sort of welcomed in more generic terms uh, what, you know, I don't remember the exact term, but, you know, the importance of calm for, for the whole of, of, of Syria. And I, I think we have received a lot of support for, uh, for our call. And the good news is that if you look at Syria, uh, you know, all over, you know, areas controlled by the government, the northwest, the northeast, it, it has been a relative, relatively speaking, a calm period. There has not been since uh, early March, there has been no all out military offensives. And these, of course, are, are good news. Uh, of we still see, of course, uh, uh, ISIL activities, we see activities from other groups also challenging. Uh, the different ceasefires that are in place. So it's still fragile. So my call is still to the Security Council and to the Syrian parties that we should work out something that in line with, by the way, in line with Security Council Resolution 2254, or something that would enable us to create a solid foundation for the political uh, process. The good news is, of course, also that uh, uh, COVID-19, uh, knock wood, has uh, really not hit uh, Syria hard at all. Uh, I think there is approximately 180 cases, but of course there is no more than approximately 6,000 been tested. But we don't see any indication that is really spreading around the country. And of course we're praying and hoping that this will still be the be the case. Yeah, I mean, and uh, it, that is, does not come as a surprise. I mean, I, I don't think many people are traveling to Syria uh, and uh, infecting the country, but you're right, one is enough uh, and uh, that would be a total disaster. Uh, yeah. let, you mentioned the, the, a stable uh, path towards peace. Uh, let me ask you something on the Constitutional Committee. Uh, a month ago, the opposing side in Syria war agreed to reconvene in Geneva for stalled negotiation on the Constitution. Uh, what is the status of the talks over the Constitutional Committee? And if I may ask you, which are the main stumbling blocks the parts will have to address? Um, as you know, we, we had, uh, what I would say, a first successful meeting of the Constitutional Committee end of October last year. As you know, we have 150 members, 50 from the opposition, 50 from the government, and 50 from so-called civil society. And then uh, the 150 has chosen uh, 15 members from each group, 15 from government, 15 from opposition, and 15 from civil society. So 45 people, that should be the drafting body that actually will do the writing of uh, the, the constitutional reform. Uh, and uh, so things, uh, you know, we had really good discussions uh, on all the different and difficult subjects, I think, related to the constitution. Then when we met the, the second time, uh, things uh, more or less collapsed and the parties were not able to sit down and to really dis discuss. 
And since then, I've been dealing with uh, disagreements on the agenda. But then, luckily enough, uh, a little bit more than a month ago, we managed to find an agreement on the agenda in line with the terms of reference and rules of procedure that I had negotiated with the parties uh, for more or less 12 months. Uh, and then uh, agreeing also that there should be no preconditions for moving forward and that we should focus on substantial discussions. You know, I, I believe this is an important step forward. But of course, as I said from day number one, uh, the, Constitution, the Constitution Committee or work on the Constitution, uh, while it's being important, it may build trust, it may build confidence, but it's only important if it achieves that and if it's a door opener to a broader political process. And so my hope is then that we will be able, maybe late August, to sit down together uh, to work uh, you know, uh, hard on, uh, uh, on, on these uh, issues. And then that, that together, hopefully, with a successful ceasefire, that we can start also addressing other issues that will lead to changes on the ground in, in Syria. That's sort of, uh, to say, that that's my work plan. And Special Emory, since you uh, mentioned the involvement of civil society, uh, yes. uh, let me take one question from the floor, which has arrived. Uh, yes. the, 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 the question is, if you can tell us a little bit more on the first formal mechanism to involve the civil society, which is the Syrian Civil Society Support Room. Could you say a few words on this, please? Yes, listen, this, this was my, my predecessor, Stefan de Mastura's, uh, you know, a genius that he managed to get uh, Syrians from different parts of the Syrian society, you know, different religious communities, uh, different sects, and, and to meet sort of uh, outside of uh, the official channels. And... Uh, through this process, uh, I, we, we, we have been able to, uh, to interact, as I said, with, um, you know, uh, civ uh, Syrian civilians living in Syria, you know, in government controlled areas, in the Northwest, in the Northeast, in the South, all over the country, representing a broad variety of, of Syrians. And of course, very important part of this, also with a, with a particular focus on making sure that we also have women representation. Yeah. And in my consultations, uh, I believe there has been at least a, a 40% of women participating. So during these last rounds, we have had, I think, approximately 1,000 people that one way or another have been interacting with us. And why is this important? Well, of course, because a, a solution to the Syrian crisis is all about meeting the aspirations of the Syrian people. Of course, Syrian civil society cannot replace the political process, but it can help to inform me and to help me to understand deeper what is at stake in the Syrian society and help us moving forward into the political process. And as I told you at the very beginning, uh, a lot of what they have told me, I then brought forward this time also to the Security Council. Yeah. The, 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 another question, we got another question which is uh, quite optimistic in, in itself because uh, uh, it, it's about uh, the reform of the security sector which is typically an important step in post-conflict to have a, a security sector which uh, represents everybody and guarantees uh, uh, personal security. So the question is, uh, to which extent do you believe a real security sector reform process is possible in Syria? Uh, as uh, the person rightly mentioned, this of course is a question about the post-conflict situation. No, that, so, that's what my addition. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's uh, for me, you know, too early to have any fixed ideas about this, but uh, obviously uh, this, this will have to be a discussion down the road. Uh, and, you know, as you know, the UN has a lot of experience in this yeah. field. Uh, but of course, what I hope to uh, be able to achieve first is that we actually start to move forward. That we you know, the, as I said, the ceasefire holds, uh, the Constitution Committee meets, we start to build the trust and confidence, and then we slowly move on to these other issues down the road. 
You mentioned uh, that the pandemic is not hitting hard, but you mentioned that uh, the uh, financial and economic crisis is hitting, and uh, the Syrian pound uh, hitting a new record low against the US dollar, dollar recently. How does the current financial crisis affect the country in real term? What has changed in the last few months, and how does it affect the stability, I would say the instability of the country? Uh, this is a key question. Uh, and I can tell you that uh, it is affecting all, absolutely all Syrians. It's, uh, you, you mentioned the Syrian pound, you know, hitting a, a new low against the US dollars. It's been a bit of uh, volatility. It sort of, you know, it reached more than 3,000 and it went down to 2,600 or whatever it was. Now I, I believe it's again up uh, against uh, more than 3,000 again. Uh, but, but of course, as I said, this is really impacting when all across, as I said, whether you live in government controlled areas, whether you live in, in the northwest or you live in the northeast or in the south. This is, this is really, uh, it's, it's really sad to, to see. Of course, this is a consequence of uh, nine, nine and a half years of, of, uh, of conflict. You know, the conflict. Uh, and, and I emphasize also this to the Security Council on uh, Tuesday. It has, you know, obviously brought destruction on serious people, the, the environment, the infrastructure, and, and I, I think also importantly to mention the very fabric of the, of the society and the, the trust, uh, the bond of trust that should sort of underpin any, any economy. So this is a very important factor. And then Related to this, there are, as you know, there's issues related to governance, uh, corruption, and mismanagement. Uh, that is also, I think, uh, contributed to this. But the immediate triggers were the crisis in Lebanon and, of course, uh, COVID, uh, COVID-19. So, uh, and then if you add to this, there is also, of course, uh, as, as many will emphasize to you, the issue of, uh, of, of, of sanctions. Right? You know, I, I, I try to emphasize when I um, discuss this that, listen, both on the political process and on the economy, things will take time before they change. But we need to see the change starting. And this is, this is my appeal both to the Syrian parties and to the international community, that if we don't start to see changes now, you know, we may meet uh, you know, three years from now, or four years from now, or five or six years, and the crisis will still be there. And let's be honest, then we really do not know where we will be. We don't know where Syria will be. We don't know where the refugee communities surrounding Syria will be. You know, we are, we are being told that 50% of the children living in the refugee communities are not receiving education. So what are, you know, we are gambling, I think, with the future not only in Syria, but in the region. Uh, the, uh, I'm, I'm listening to you, I'm, I'm, I, I'm even more concerned by this getting used to the Syrian crisis from abroad. Yes. And you were mentioning uh, the uh, economic uh, difficult situation that the country is facing. And again, after nine years in which we know that there is no work, uh, no uh, people leave, uh, half of the population is out, uh, outplaced. So nobody is surprised by that. So we are getting used. How would you describe what it's not possible to do in Syria now for normal people to someone outside to let them understand? How would you dramatize, which is not dramatizing by the way, it's the reality. How would you express that? Which appeal would you do to express that? No, as you rightly said, is it's not to dramatize. This is uh, yeah. this is the reality. You know, it's it's been a, a uh, uh, based. You know, the salaries are no longer sufficient, really sufficient to to uh, to buy the necessary food or, ne uh, or medicine. Uh, the World Food Program just came out with a prognosis saying that you know more than nine million people are food insecure. And my friend, the, uh, the director of uh, the World Food Program, uh, the executive director, Beasley, said that 
you know, famine is knocking on the door. This is, you know, it, it, it's a very dramatic situation. So, you know, we are being told that uh, shops are being closed, uh, pharmacies are being closed, uh, and prices are skyrocketing. Uh, you know, uh, linked to linked to all of this. So uh, I can tell you that life for ordinary Syrians or Syrians all over, it is really getting intolerable. It's 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 uh, it's a disaster. It, it is. Yeah. Let, let me now move a little bit to the northwest. Uh, the lack of, as you mentioned, significant clashes. Yes seem to suggest that the ceasefire agreed by Russia and Turkey at the beginning of March is still somehow holding. Uh, nevertheless, uh, previous experiences remind us of the high volatility of the area and the persistent risk of hostilities uh, resumption. Can I ask you what is your assessment on the current situation in Idlib and which elements do you consider necessary for the continuation of the truce? No, you, I, I agree with your description of the realities on the ground. Yes, this, since uh, the 5th of March, uh, the ceasefire has uh, by and large been holding. That's, uh, that's the good news. Uh, at the same time, we have seen uh, increasingly violations of the ceasefire. We have seen uh, attempts at cross-line uh, activities from uh, uh, militant groups. We just a few days ago we had uh, some of the uh, terrorist organizations uh, attacking Syrian soldiers and killing a, a few. We have seen the first uh, pro uh, uh, you know government forces aerial attacks again. Uh, and, but at the same time we have also and, and we, we've seen some activities from some of the militants group to reorganize and sort of challenge, and, and we are afraid may challenge the ceasefire. This is a, this is a great concern. And, and then, of course, at the same time, we are seeing reinforcement. We are seeing Turkish uh, reinforcement uh, of soldiers and military equipment. And then also, of course, on, on the other side, uh, we, we, we are seeing the same. We are also seeing that part of the agreement was that Russia and Turkey should do joint patrols along the M4 highway. Uh, that has been complicated, but they are making progress. And uh, uh, both, I'm, you know, I'm in close dialogue with my Russian and Turkish friends, and they are both assuring me that they are doing their utmost to to make sure that the ceasefire will hold. But of course, there are a, a few elements that needs to be be raised uh, or added to what I said, and that, of course, is is the pre presence of you uh, enlisted terrorist groups uh, and as you know this has been a constant challenge so the russian says that this is not to be handled by by turkey uh, i have appealed to the security council that there should be what i call a cooperative approach and that you know if one targets a terrorist to make sure that you know the, the, the you know it's the terrorist and not the civilians that yeah, are being targeted and that international humanitarian law is being respected. And I said before that, you know, if, you know, last year, or even the beginning of this year, when we saw, you know, more than 900,000 people fleeing from attacks, that is not the way to fight terrorists. You know, this, this is a way uh, to basically destroy whatever is left of the Syrian civil fabric. And, uh, and I think we should be able to work out on, uh, on, on this as well. Uh, so, so I, I, you know, I say, yes, there are new elements that was not there before um, the, the 5th of March that could make it possible for us this time to see that the ceasefire holds. But some of the underlying factors are still there. And I, here I should also add, of course, the whole issue about humanitarian assistance, which of course is also important for Italy, but also for many areas of of, um, of, of Syria. And here is, the, as you know, the discussion about uh, cross-line and cross-border operations. And as you know, the Secretary General's position here is very clear. We both need cross-line and cross-border operations. And he has appealed to the Security Council uh, that uh, they need to renew 
the uh, the resolution that allows for cross line operations. Uh, sorry, cross border operations. I have another question, uh, which has a, a, again an optimistic spirit, uh, because it's asking you uh, if and when do you see any prospect for the return of refugees uh, or reconstruction? This is a one million dollar, one trillion dollar. Because now it's only trillion. If and when any prospect for to, for the return of refugees in this scenario that you so kindly described? Listen, I. Uh, you know, the return of for refugees is, of course, it's, it's their decision. And so far, I think the, 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 the overwhelming majority of the refugees have decided that the time is not uh, right to return to Syria. And of course, it's obvious why. Uh, the reason is that they don't feel that uh, this, this is, situation is safe, that is, it is not calm, and that it is, uh, will not bring them the security and the livelihood that uh, they, they want. So I think uh, the return of Syrian refugees uh, would require that we ha have progress both when it comes to the ceasefire and to the political process. And that the combination of a ceasefire, the political process, that this could create what I call a safe, calm and neutral environment in Syria that would uh, allow the Syrian refugees and the IDPs to return, you know, in a dignified and voluntarily and safe manner to their homes. But I can, you know, but this is of course something that the Syrians first and foremost really want to see happening. And I think we all want to be part of that process to make sure that that actually happens. But it, it, it is, you know, you, you don't have a magic wand that you can sort of show and, and that would trigger this to happen. It's hard and serious work that will allow this to happen. But uh, Mr. Peterson, are you, uh, your office, uh, is your office also monitoring the situation of the Syrians which are abroad? Because they left the country years ago and they went, most of them went to Lebanon, Jordan, which were different countries six years ago. I mean, yes. uh, Jordan is facing an incredible crisis uh, Lebanon is uh, uh, in, uh, in an incredible crisis, uh, even more. And so uh, w w their life abroad may be much more difficult than it was before as well. I mean, and by the way, most of them, the, the one who left at the beginning were the rich one, the one who had money and went to relatives and to nice houses in a neighboring country, but the entire situation is different. What's going on with the refugees in neighboring countries? No, this is a, a, a not only a good question, it, it's, a, it's a very important observation. Uh, and it just proves that a very challenging situation for refugees. Uh, you know, you mentioned Jordan, you mentioned uh, Lebanon, most probably not as difficult in Turkey, but of course also challenges in uh, in Turkey where you have, you know, 3.6 million, close to 3.6 million refugees. And of course, the economic collapse in Lebanon, uh, the COVID-19 and the measures taken for that and the political crisis in Lebanon, all of these things are creating new uncertainties for the refugees in Lebanon. And as you rightly pointed out, also challenges in Jordan, uh, but in, I, I think in particular, we, we see this in, in, uh, in, in, in Lebanon. And it is uh, something, of course, that uh, we uh, are following closely. And as you both are saying, of course, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees uh, following, of course, on, on a, an overlay basis to monitor and to see, uh, to follow this situation very, very, very closely. That's a very serious issue. I, I really, I was in Jordan uh, re in Lebanon recently and uh, before the COVID, I can't imagine yes. uh, how is it now to be a refugee in, in this country where there is a need to help the locals. And, uh, and, and there is no help for the locals, by the way. Now, let's move to a la the large picture. I have another question which open up. And... Uh, we would like you to comment on this issue. To what extent the Syrian conflict and its difficulties in to be solved are an illustration of shifting world politics, especially with regard to the shift from a unipolar US-dominated world 
order to a more confused multipolar one. Is uh, uh, Syria a good example of this uh, more complicated non-unipolar world or would you consider this to be a, a, an exception uh, by itself? Um, you know, if, if you look at the big picture, of course, the dominant, if, if you look at the globally where we are now, of course, the dominant uh, uh, new development is, of course, the rise of China. And, uh, and the second is, of course, uh, challenges to, to the global economy. And then linked to all of this is the question about, uh, you know, UN presence in, in the Middle East, it's uh, 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 private pivots towards Asia, and all of these, uh, these uh, questions. I, I th I, in my opinion, the chances related uh, to, to Syria are very specific. Uh, we, we have to remember that uh, when it comes to Syria, uh, Syria has uh, since uh, the 1970s sort of had close relations relationship with the Soviet Union. Uh, Syria was uh, never, uh, you know, never close to, for the last 50 years, I've never been close to the United States. So it's sort of, that, that sort of, it, it, it's an important element to keep in mind. Huh? Uh, also, uh, you know, the relationship with Lebanon, uh, Hezbollah, I don't need to go into all, all of this. And also, of course, with, with, um, uh, with the emergence of uh, the, the um, uh, the new uh, leaders in Iran in 1977, 79, sorry, uh, Iran and Syria established close relationship. Of course, we, do, we don't have to go into all of these things. So uh, then uh, let's not go into all the issues related to the, um, uh, to the Arab Spring, but then we, when uh, uh, the revolution or conflict or whatever you want to call it started in Syria, uh, it, what we have seen, I think, is gradually, of course, that the military aspects of the conflict has come under the control of uh, the government uh, of Russia and of Iran. So I, you, you, I think it's fair to say that there is no longer a, a military challenge to, uh, to the government. But I think at the same time, what we see is that, you know, the, the collapse of the economy, uh, the willingness of the U.S. to use its leverage, its presence in the in in, in the Northeast, uh, the sanctions that they're introducing, all of these means that within the international community, uh, there is no one that can dictate the outcome of the Syrian conflict. So you still, you know, there are different strengths and weaknesses of the international players, but for, you know, for none of them can sit down and dictate and say this is how we want this conflict to end there needs to be international negotiations there needs to be a dialogue with the syrian parties and i said that this can only be achieved if there is a real give and take if there is what i call a step for step approach where you identify what you are willing to put on the table where the syrians identify what they are willing to put on the table and then that we break this vicious cycle with an understanding of what are the realities on the ground. And uh, this, uh, you know, this, this kind of realities, uh, as we know, is not, not new. You will have that in many, many different conflict situations. But I think it's, for me, the important part is, it's not, not, not possible for one side to dictate the outcome of the conflict. Uh, this another question help us on this issue to further the, the, have further details on this issue because you mentioned that no one can decide for for to solve the crisis there must be some kind of agreement dialogue negotiation between the big actor and you mentioned before that with Russia and Turkey uh, there is some kind of coordination your yourself and your counterpart uh, the same two countries, not far away from Syria, are not having a good dialogue in Libya, uh, uh, to say the least. Mm. Uh, do you see any any spillover, or do, are you are we facing two different uh, sets of attitude and posture in the two countries by the same two countries uh, powers? 
to, to put it like this, I'm asking myself the same questions. And I'm afraid <laughs> at this stage, I don't have the answer. <laughs> <laughs> but on your side, you, at least so far, so good. Uh, yeah, no, but that, that's really, uh, because while it is clear and understandable what you said before, that no one alone can solve the crisis. And so you need some adaptation. Yes, yes, it's yes. really uh, uh, quite striking that two countries playing a big role in Syria are playing a big role yes. in Libya and they are not exactly sitting on the same uh, side. Uh, yeah. and, uh, of course, so, they're not, they sort of not sitting on the same side in Syria either. So, you know, they're, they're, so it's, yeah. it's, but the they, dialogue at this stage, at least, seems to be, you know, not good. So far, it's been moving in the right direction, it seems. Yeah, yeah. No, they're not sitting on the same side, but they are not bombing each other, exactly. at least. That's, exactly. That's, exactly. Uh, uh, you mentioned the, the, um, the uh, economic crisis in, in Syria, and I have another question from the floor. Yes. You mentioned the economic crisis, and uh, uh, Syria has also uh, sanctions. Uh, and the question is, uh, what is the impact of these sanctions on your mandate, if there is any? You know, uh, as I, I mentioned, obviously this is a part of what I call the realities in Syria. I, I should say what, has, what both the Secretary General and I have focused on is, of course, to make sure that sanctions do not hit the humanitarian and medical supplies to Syria. And we, we, we've been very clear, you know, both with the European Union and with the United States uh, on this message, and they are reassuring us uh, and this is, uh, you know, something we're discussing on a regular basis. Uh, they assure us that it should not have an impact on the humanitarian or, or medical supplies. And they, they, they challenge us and they tell us, if, if there are instances where you, have, you face challenges on this, let us know and we will, we will sort it out. Then I think, you know, the whole question of sanctions, uh, you know, for, from the, in particular from the United States. I, I read, you know, uh, the, uh, yes, it was yesterday when uh, sort of the, the so-called Caesar Act came into effect. And I read what was said then from uh, uh, the, the, the American um, uh, envoy, uh, Mr. James, uh, Ambassador Jeffrey. And it seems to me very clear that the Amer what the Americans want is to, to sort of, uh, give the message that this is part of the leverage they have, and they want this to be part of the discussion that they are having. So in that sense, yes, sanctions do indeed have an impact also on the work that we are doing. Yeah. The, the resolution uh, 2254 speaks of uh, constitution and election. Uh, how realistic is to talk or to plan for election in the foreseeable future, and if not election in the near future, uh, what would you see as the relevant track to push forward uh, in the negotiation process in parallel with the Constitution uh, Committee work? Yeah, another difficult question. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I. As you know, uh, Security Council Resolution 2254 is very clear. It says, you know, constitution, and then pursuant to, to a new constitution, there shall be elections, you know, uh, held to the highest international standards on the UN supervision, where also the diaspora should be eligible to participate. So this is the, sort of the marching order I have received from the Security Council to prepare for this. So obviously the first challenge is to get, uh, you know, then uh, a, a constitutional reform and then start working on, 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 on elections. So, you know, I, you know if, if we get to the situation where actually we have a serious work on the constitution, then hopefully it will also be possible uh, in dialogue with the Syrian parties, with the international community, also to move forward on this. But, but listen, very important that you know I, we don't take a step back and say we wait for this. So what what we need also to do, of course, is as I said to make sure that the ceasefire holds, that we work on changing the environment inside of Syria, 
so that we can have, as I said many times, what I call a safe, calm and neutral environment developing in Syria. And of course, a very important aspect of that would be the release of abductees and detainees and more information about all the too many missing people in Syria. You know, this is, this is a file that is a tragedy rather, that is affecting nearly all Syrians. And it is something that Syria will, will have to come to terms with. It's an important part, it's a humanitarian, important humanitarian thing, but it's also something if it's done in, in the right manner and help to build trust and help us to move forward together with all these other things that I mentioned. There is a question which refers to your long career as a diplomat and mediator and your previous uh, uh, involvement during the Oslo Agreement back in the 90s. And the question is, uh, both were difficult situation, but how would you uh, briefly compare the challenges of the two uh, uh, endeavors? The, uh, the Palestinian Israeli file and the Syrian file. Yeah. <laughs> that would require 45 minutes. <laughs> yeah, which, which we don't have, but uh, we but know you let, are... me, let me say that, you know, um, when the Oslo negotiations started, no one really believed it would be possible. Hmm? It, it, it was, you know, but then you know, uh, I, I don't have to go into all this, but as you know, the, the, the geopolitical climate changed dramatically hmm? with the collapse of communism. Uh, and uh, suddenly we, you know, so, so, and then there was an opening that the two parties themselves decided for, for many reasons that we don't have time for now, they decided to move forward on this, to grasp this unique opportunity. Then there are many things to to be said about why we are in Palestine where we are today, I will not go into that. So what I'm looking for is sort of, you know, as I said before, I'm looking for, you know, elements that can create these ripe conditions in Syria for us to move forward. And, I, and I've said, you know, I said to the Syrian parties, I said to the government in Damascus, I said to the opposition, I said to the Americans, to the Russians, to the Iranians, to the Turks, to the Europeans, to the Arabs, I said, Listen, you know, when we look at the crisis today, you may think that there are only different interests. I don't think so. I do genuinely believe that there are a lot of common interests when it comes to Syria. Things that should be able to unite us. The most obvious thing, of course, is the fight against terror. It's something that should unite us. The second is the need for stability in Syria, something that should unite us. The third is to create conditions for the voluntary return of refugees, something that should unite us. And for all of this, you need a political process. You need a credi credible political process. And that's the little detail that I'm trying to work on. They, uh, it, it was extremely uh, inspiring listening to you. Uh, you have been extremely honest in your comment, as usual, and also extremely generous in uh, uh, t touching on many issues. Uh, we, the only thing we can do is to wish you good luck for what you're doing and uh, the hope to seeing you in Rome uh, soon, inshallah. We, that means that uh, uh, we can still meet in person and, uh, and hoping that you have something good and positive to tell us as uh, you are on what you are trying to do. Good luck again and thank you very much. Paolo, thank you so much. Great to be with you too again, though it was virtually. Hope, as you said, to see you in, in Rome soon. And uh, stay safe, stay healthy. And to all who participated, thank you so much. It's been really an honor and a pleasure being with you again. Ours. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.